Well, essentially, we're going to cover a lot of things that, um, that my team and I learned doing a lot of audits to different sites. So when I say audits, I just mean um, looking at uh, SEO, SEM, CRO, WPO, all those acronyms that uh, I'm sure you're already tired of hearing. But basically, look at all those qualities that make a site successful, these kind of overlapping modalities and competencies that we need to know as professionals and developers or marketers or whatever to make a site actually successful today because it's just not as easy as it used to be. I remember when you know SEO was meta text, right? Um, so those days are long gone. So what we're going to talk about today is 15 secrets, far more than that, it's like 40 secrets of top media companies. Um, just to, to get a, a kind of a baseline here, I want to get an idea of who's in the room. So developers, plugging the team, supporting people, okay. Uh, who actually never contributed to the codex on lots of theories? Who knows what the codex is? Okay, so were you all in Eric's talk or you just already know the, the codex? Excellent, that's a great talk. Okay. Uh, who reads Mashable? Okay, who uses W3 Total Cash in this book? Okay, that should be more people. <laughs> There's another release coming out. It'll be worth it. It'll be an Apple-like experience for once. Look forward to it. So, I'm the senior technical advisor at Mashable. Um, I was the founding CTO for about five years, so I built that company to scale into WordPress and other technologies. Um, I founded W3 Edge, which is an interactive marketing company, and now we make products like W3 Total Cash and other things come. Uh, I co-founded a company called Playster, which uses WordPress and other technologies uh, to make marketing tools for real estate professionals. And uh, I founded W3 Markup, which uh, among several things, takes people's artwork and actually made WordPress themes and uh, plugins to customize their sites and kind of streamline that and outsourcing that. So to jump right in, and I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to wear a number of hats here. Sorry, I got my cues and stuff. Um, I'm going to wear a number of hats. I'm going to wear a marketing hat, I'm going to wear a developer hat, I'm going to wear a WordPress developer hat, I'm going to wear just a number of hats, so bear with me. So, when you're trying to be successful, you need to make data-driven decisions. Okay, so that means you need to consistently measure and figure out what it is that you're actually after. So there's a number of things that, that, you, can, that you can think about. Usually those are vanity metrics when you just get started, you know, how many followers do I have, you know, um, how many likes did I get, those kinds of things. Those things are fine, especially when you're starting out, because you know, you've got to compare everything to zero. But we're going to take that as a little step further as we move forward. So there's so many different networks and services and places where you can engage, right? Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, on down the line. Okay, so each one of these different um, networks and services has a different type of audience. So you have to think about who it is that's there and kind of get some feedback by interacting in those different uh, networks to figure out how you dial in your message for those particular areas. Okay, so the way to think about it is just because you write a blog post and it's called you know, whatever the title is doesn't mean that's the same title that you tweet out. I mean, you could have crafted it just a brilliant headline or title or something. That's not necessarily what you want to have posting on Facebook or on Pinterest or what have you. Okay, so really important to think about that kind of thing. One of the other things to think about is the, um, the modalities. Um, so we already talked about the hubs. You know, those are you know Facebook, uh, Google, LinkedIn, Yelp, all these different kinds of you know whether it's hyper local or just you know general online hubs with different types of folks in them. You're going to cultivate those communities, and you have to figure out a way to do that. We'll talk a little bit more about how you kind of measure when you're doing it. Um, but you also have to consider the, the media formats that you're going to be able to consistently create, right? So there's, you know, there's, there's video, there's audio, I mean, there's, it, could be, it could be YouTube, it could be your own recordings, it could be um, you know, podcasts of different formats. Um, obviously, you guys all know that like Facebook, excuse me, that uh, WordPress supports post formats. So you can make great use of that kind of thing for originating content on your own site. But when you share all of that out, you got to figure out what does really well. So we all know that Pinterest is great for uh, images and video. Um, obviously, you know, it should be noted that you, know, you shouldn't share like a 300 by 240 pixel image on Pinterest. It's not going to do very well. Right? It needs to be high res. You, know, you need to know how to optimize that. You have to grab tools like JPEG Mini or. PNG and 
get your high quality image shared out there, get your attribution right, get your messaging right, do you know, all those different things that you have to do. Same thing on, on Facebook, right? Media does far better than sharing links. You know, Twitter is really oriented around links. So uh, even, you know, even though they uh, support in inline um, media and uh, tweet deck and everywhere else now, still, you know, Twitter is primarily about uh, links. But sharing media is going to be far better on, uh, on social media. So in terms of tracking activity, it's really important, and I see this just incessant, you know, because all the different tools kind of favor a URL shortener, so I have to highlight this. Take that URL shortener and stick with it, okay? Bitly, for example, will give you some analytics. Um, it'll give you a better idea of how your content's being consumed. Make sure you just try to stick with one. I don't really care which one it is, but if you want to go back and like try to figure out, you know, if the juice is worth the squeeze, you know, if your efforts kind of yielded something desirable, that's the way to do it. Just stick with something uh, in terms of sharing those links out and making it consistent. So another thing I also see is if you're actually, you know, encouraging people to retweet things on Twitter, which is obviously something that you should do, you really, or you're retweeting yourself, you really want to go for a native retweet, all right? So the tools out there that actually, you know, tell you how many retweets you got as opposed to using the RT kind of, you know, shorthand, which is around for ages, it, it's not the same thing. You want to make sure that you actually get a native retweet. It makes all the difference in the world if you're actually trying to analyze it. Um, in terms of site structure, okay, so we're thinking about on your particular site or whoever site you're helping. Common issues that I'm seeing uh, just incessantly are too many tags, too many categories. If you've got a category driven navigation, that's awesome. Uh, but you don't need 45 categories. Okay, you want to dial that in, not, not just because of SEO, but for usability reasons, for you know, your own purposes in terms of being a webmaster or a publisher. So dial that in if you can to you know, seven, eight categories, keep it focused. Tags, same deal. Okay? The worst thing in the world in terms of user experience is when you've got 300 tags because, you know, let's face it, none of us know any better. We all made these mistakes. And, you know, someone clicks through on the, on the tags on the post page or something like that, and they land on a tag, you know, archive page or whatever and they only see a post, right? That's a terrible experience. Not because, you know, it's incorrect that you only tag that once, but you could have more easily had 15, 20 tags and made sure that when you took the time to try to curate your data, that you landed somewhere on a page that actually gave them what they're looking for. They wanted to drill down into whatever that, that uh, subtopic was. Give them exactly that. So in terms of cleaning that up, I think actually Gilles the Bach came out with a tool recently. If you haven't seen it, go check out his blog. I don't remember the exact title of the post. He's got a great tool out there to help you kind of clean that up and dial that in. So it's, uh, it's pretty sweet. Um, in terms of archives, uh, who actually uses um, like the permanent structure 2010, 2012, board slash this, board slash that? Anybody still doing that? Oh, I'm, I'm shocked. Okay, that's great. So if you see anybody doing that, you know, kind of wrap them on the wrist there and help them stop doing that. Uh, it doesn't really help you unless you know exactly what you're doing with it. So in terms of um, maximizing where you are and trying to get ready to take the next step, Google Webmaster Tools is obviously free. It's a phenomenal tool. You can jump in there and you can kind of find your low hanging fruit. What I mean by that is if you're ranking at all at Google and you want to identify um, some places for improvement, you can actually go into one of these views, I'm getting the name of it offhand, but somewhere in there, there's, uh, there's only a few screens to, to drill down into, but you can actually do a couple of sorts. You can sort by impression, um, you can sort by uh, volume of searches, essentially, or reach, and then you can obviously sort, uh, sort by your uh, click-through rate. And so what you want to do is you want to find the intersection of whatever's generating most impressions whatever's uh, potentially generating the, uh, the highest click-through rate, and then figure out if, one, if you can move your ranking at all for those particular keywords to help you out, or um, the reverse. You could look at, okay, I'm ranking in the top 10 for this, but my click-through rate's poor. You know, what can I do to improve my click-through rate? So there's things like working on rich snippets. Um, obviously, there's just lots of ways to dial in your content to figure out, you know, what exactly is going wrong? Am I not getting you know, the traffic from Google that I should get, even though I'm on the first page? Obviously, whether or not you're below the fold is not super critical. The most important thing is you don't want a case where you've got you know, tens of thousands of impressions, only a few clicks, just a digital uh, click-through rate. The other thing to think about is um, don't be scared of long tail. 
Okay, so short tail versus long tail, basically what I mean is multiple keyword, uh, multiple term uh, keyword phrases, like four or five or so. Usually what I see in the wild is that um, if you're able to optimize your site uh, well, you've got good looking content and everything else, Webmaster Tools will help you bubble up a whole bunch of keywords that you know people are actually searching for. You'll see um, some keywords in there that actually have you know, 30, 40, 50 on up um, conversion rate percentages, which is phenomenal. So try to figure out what's working, take it all off the plate, you know, don't leave anything on the table, I should say, and um, you know, do your experiments and figure out how you can get more of those pictures. Another thing that's really interesting is that uh, um, Google Analytics, which is a great free tool, I and mean, they're making it more and more enterprise, which uh, honestly I can't be unhappy about. They've got this, uh, this multi-channel funnel. Um, anybody who's doing that, I'm just curious. All right, it's fairly recent. So what it does is it allows you to stop kind of in the same vein as vanity metrics that kind of just that helps you understand that you know, something's moving up to the right, hopefully. Multi-channels is a step further than just saying, you know, hey, this conversion just came from Google or this conversion came from Twitter. It helps you understand that all the different touch points that actually occurred that drove that conversion. Conversion means, you know, lots of different things. Somebody signed up for the newsletter, they found the e-books, they, you know, they did a retweet, they did whatever it is that you were after, right? So this gives you a visualization just like their, um, uh, just like the visualization they have for past through site help you understand what exactly all the different touch points are. So try to set that up. It's not super hard. They have videos and everything else. It's free, so you've got to do it. So in terms of transparency, one thing I see with a lot of publishers is they just don't necessarily communicate their intent and vision. Right? So you see gadget sites, you see fashion sites, you see all these different types of sites. They don't really say what's different or why anybody should stick around them, what's special about them, what the point of view is, you know, who the authors are, who's contributing, why the site exists. All that kind of thing needs to be transparent if you want to actually make kind of a destination site, something that people appreciate and that resonates with an audience. But basically what you're doing, you know, in one degree or another, is you're trying to create a movement around your content when you produce a site. Um, I won't get too much into that at the moment, but hopefully I'll have time to touch on that a little bit later. So I already talked about you know, who you are, um, why you're talking about these things, what you stand for, what's your point of view, and all those things are, are critical, including you know, your background and credibility. Even if you have not, hey, I'm just some guy starting out doing this because I love it. That's totally valid. And also, um, something that I see people kind of scared to do at all different kinds of levels, small business, large business, what have you, um, social proof is critical. So if you've got some mentions, some accolades, you know, it's not bragging if it's the truth. You know, if the facts is put there. Um, you see it everywhere on, on lots of product driven kinds of businesses. There's no reason why you can't do that. You produce content, that's all I do. Uh, or if you've been mentioned in, you know, even, it has, even if it hasn't been in the New York Times, just go ahead and take credit where it's due. Uh, all it's going to do is help. So in terms of thinking, when you're putting together a site, when you're managing a site, when you're trying to help someone be successful, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, you've got to think about the fact that every single page on the site is actually a search is like a results page. Like if we talked about tags a moment ago, when someone clicks on that tag, they want to see technically a search for that tag, search results page for that tag. You know, then on your home page, they want to see an optimized page for them. Maybe if you don't do personalization, that'd be great if you did, but regardless, that home page should be dialed in for exactly who it is that you're engaging with so that you can give them exactly what they're looking for. This is how you reduce your bounce rate, this is how you increase your conversion rate, your time on site, and, uh, and we'll also talk about what I call next click opportunities a little bit later. But you've got to think about your site in this way because that's actually how it works. If you're a developer, you know that basically <laughs> work right is going to see what you request. Okay, yeah, there it is. Everything is a search for those things. So try to think that way and you'll make much more usable websites. But just includes thinking about things like you know, related content, tweet, uh, uh, trending content, um, uh, feature content, personalized content, all these types of things. You can dial all that in and create, uh, create a much more engaging website. In terms of usability, um, there's a couple of trends that I think are pretty valid and, and not necessarily try to overuse right now. One of them is like uh, what you see on Lighthacker. They've got the features to, uh, excuse me, fixed sidebar so you can scroll through the content but the sidebar stays fixed. 
kind of showcasing or highlighting whatever they think is important there. Whether it's in Tokyo, you see lots of uh, websites with a, a masthead or a, a header that kind of gets fixed at the top of the page as you scroll through, uh, either in addition to or in lieu of breadcrumbs, you know, so you can find your path through. Both of those techniques, I think, increase the usability of a site tremendously. I, I don't think that they're uh, overused. I don't know if any plugins that kind of help you get that set up that your developers can figure it out. Um, so experiment with those and see if those help your uh, time on site. In terms of just general success principles, something that I, I think that people kind of take for granted, despite the fact that everybody has probably an iPad, an iPhone, an Android, a Nexus 7, or whatever the heck else, uh, several screens. Um, you can't leave visitors behind. All right, so you, know, you can obviously go into Google Analytics. You can get a clear idea of how much mobile traffic we got. But most of you are probably going to have, if you've got a site that's, that's doing well at all, you're going to have some people that are on a tablet, all right? You should optimize that experience. Um, it's, I won't say it's super easy, but it's straightforward. Figure out what you can do. Like maybe you can have com uh, comments in a, in a rail on the right or in someone's in a uh, landscape, all right? There's things that you can do to make sure that when some of those to your website, you're not leaving them, uh, giving them a negative experience. One thing I see in lots of, uh, with lots of larger brands is that, you know, they'll have like a mobile app. So you go to their site on your mobile device and it says, hey, download our app. But like the reason why you went to the site is because you were trying to find their address or their phone number or something. And there's a big ad that's blocking you from figuring out and the, the damn address isn't even on there in the first place, right? So just think about it a little bit. It'll make a difference. The more traffic you get, the more time you can invest in it and it'll make sense. In terms of content marketing strategy, which, you know, I don't know, who thinks about content marketing strategy like constantly? All right, that's great. Should be more people, should be everybody, okay? Because just like usability, progressive enhancement, or responsive web design, all these kinds of things that are supposed to make your content accessible, uh, your content marketing strategy is basically how you think about presenting information, presenting your information to people in a way that actually makes them want to read it, right? So it's all about the delivery or presentation to a certain extent. So there's all these different modalities of content, how-tos, walkthroughs, tours, interviews, roundups, collections, infographics, um, even tools, for example, like Yoast makes, Yoast of Office makes all the time. I pick on him because it's just, you know, it's neat to pick on him for all these wonderful things he does. Um, they're phenomenal ways to kind of give something to your community and cultivate, like I call, like I called it earlier, a movement. You know, it's like all these people that are basically interested in your thought leadership. Um, so those tools can obviously graduate into products, which is something that we saw like um, years ago before Rand Fishkin's SEO mod became a subscription-based service. He and other guys like Jim, um, uh, Jim Boykin, for example, had lots and lots of SEO tools that they were giving away for free to let people try for at least a couple of years. Next thing you know, they have subscription-based services. So think about that in terms of monetizing your site as well. Another thing that I really think is super important, and I, I can't say it's like a silver bullet for everyone, but uh, using StumbleUpon is surprisingly effective for driving traffic. So like I said, each one of these networks and services has different communities of folks who are actually on them, okay? But in terms of your ability to buy traffic and get people to spend time on your site and, and basically light up your, your site like a Christmas tree for a few bucks, phenomenal service just to figure out you know, what happens when you throw some traffic at your website. I'm trying to think about how to ask this question. Um, how many people out there actually join in conversations on social media? Okay. How many people who are joining those conversations are doing it because they have some value to add? Or and I don't value is not opinion usually unless it's like 90% facts. Okay. You're joining those conversations because. You either want to you know, have some brand recognition or you want to actually kind of address someone's views. Who's doing it for those reasons? Okay. Those are basically the only reasons why anyone should open their mouth on social media. Okay, like I'm saying, you know, feel free to do whatever you want, right? Everyone's a publisher, you know, in today's kind of market and social media. But I'm saying in terms of your goals as publishers, you don't really want to inject yourself into conversations unless you're going to be adding some kind of value. And sometimes a good joke is a lot of value, okay? So don't think it's wrong. But I see a lot of people who are either broadcasting, so they're taking those, those posts, those 
these headlines, and now it's a tweet with a link, and they're just broadcasting that out, and maybe they get some retweets. And unless you've got some serious network effect, like you know, like Mashable or something like that, it's not really going to work. You know, I know it looks like it works, but it, it doesn't work. You know, take the time to kind of craft that message. Take the time to, to you know, follow those hashtags or whatever it is. You know, join those other communities and engage with those people, you know, providing your, your own brand and insight, your own flavor of perspective. And, uh, and that's the way forward in terms of cultivating that community. Editorial linking is a super huge rampant problem. It's like a virus. A lot of people don't seem to understand that. Who knows what I'm talking about already? It's highly interactive people, you gotta use your hands. Okay. Um, editorial linking essentially says, it does a number of things. One of them that I want to highlight right now is a lot of times when you're, you're doing your thing, you're publishing, you're generating some, some traffic, you're cultivating some backlinks because of that great content that you're producing, one of the things that happens is um, you end up with no control over the anchor text in the backlinks that are actually pointing to your website. Uh, what that means is you, know, you end up ranking for all these kind of weird things like your brand name. Right? No one searches for brand name unless you're famous. So rank free brand name is trivial and it shouldn't be a focus. So what ends up happening is editorial linking, and to some degree, allows you to say to all the search engines, hey, I'm running this post, and within the copy of this post, I'm going to indicate to you that this anchor text that I've carefully crafted in context, you know, I'm going to point to this other post and tell you the search engine what that post is actually about. Right, so that that page that's a, that's basically developed all these this this, uh, this link love or these votes from other sites online is going to pass that kind of signal to another page in your website. And so the way to think about it is you can do a couple of those, you know, if they're appropriate on a given uh, on a given post, and it helps you actually increase the relevancy and the ranking of uh, some of your your content. Not to mention, it drives what we call those those next click opportunities. So if it's another post, like hey, as as discussed in this previous post, boom, there's a link to the other post. Obviously, it's a bad example. You want to use some anchor text if you can, but doing that kind of thing two or three times, you know, once is even fine as appropriate in your content is a great thing to do, right? I see that a lot on Giga All National does it. You know, you see it on Huffington Post. That's what the big guys are doing. Editorial linking is huge. Okay, so there's some plugins out there that I think try to help you do that. They usually break on a larger site. Uh, besides the fact that you want to kind of dial that in manually anyway. But um, anyway, take the time to figure that out. Letting your users subscribe to, to various types of content is, uh, is a great way to get your conversion rates up. It helps, you know, it allows people to basically stick to a couple of topics that they're interested in. Unfortunately, I don't know any plugins that help you with newsletters so much. Um, there's probably some, some stuff out there from BuddyPress that's helpful. Um, but in any event, this is uh, one of the trends that's, that's not to be overlooked, the whole personalization and, and curation kind of themes out there. So look at doing that. So if nothing else, it helps you understand what kind of content that you should be creating because you can see how many subscribers and followers that you've got. Some people like making different Facebook pages around different topics. So lots of ways to do it. So think creatively about trying to figure out what people are actually subscribing to so you can dial it in and focus on it. In terms of technical stuff, I'm gonna go faster on this stuff since you're a developer heavy here. Uh, but getting your head right is critical. And so titles need to be natural. There's not really a need, a need to have your brand name in it. It should probably be a sentence as terse as possible. Uh, it shouldn't just be, you know, web design, right? You know, I know that that feels good as you know as engineers. Like that's what I want. Right into that. But it's not natural. Don't do it. Um, meta tags and, uh, and in terms of keywords and descriptions are still useful. Um, uh, there's various services, uh, social networks that still use those things, uh, even though Google kind of ignores them. By the same token, Open Graph, super huge. It's used not only by Facebook, LinkedIn uses it. I'm sure lots of other people use it and don't tell us. So, you know, Google that if you're not already using it, get it set up and dialed in. WordPress SEO helps you out with that quite a bit. Uh, I have a plugin coming out that goes uh, far beyond that. Hopefully we'll get it out this year. So. Make sure you do that every page, no exceptions. Um, by the same token, if you're confused and you don't know if you've got it dialed in or if it's not, you don't know what the heck's going on, there's a tool that you can use, a Facebook debugger for that, and just tell you everything that's broken, and tell you how to set up your, uh, your Facebook admin um, and everything else. You can get your stats and your insights from Facebook. 
just take the time. It doesn't take too long if you're a Google developer. Get that down. There. Another thing that's, that's rampant in Google, Web, Google Webmaster Tools helps you with this as well is duplicate meta tags and titles. Um, basically, if you want something to rank, it's got to have a title. Um, unique titles are obviously important. There's no sense in having duplicate meta tags anywhere. It, just, it makes absolutely no sense. If you're doing that and Google's indicating that to you, it's just you know, shame on you. Just get rid of it. It's better to have nothing at all than to have duplicates. Right? You're kind of sending too much noise and not enough signal. Um, I also recommend adding copy to your archive templates for, um, for categories and tags, uh, at least if you want to rank. Um, that content should be usable for a visitor, but it also should you know, help differentiate your various pages to search engines, right? So they have you know, uh, increased uh, propensity or likelihood to be ranked. In terms of other mechanics, I mean, who doesn't use Webmaster Tools? All right, good. Did someone raise their hand? Can't <laughs> All right, anyway, make sure you do. It's free, obviously, as we talked about. Same thing for Bing. I found out, I found that actually people who get all registered with Bing actually start to see better rankings on Bing, ironically. Um, using rel author, super critical, okay, because if you've ever seen those, um, if you've ever been logged into Google, even if you're not logged into Google, actually, if you ever see those avatars next to uh, search results, um, that's how they did that. So I won't explain how to do that. Here, developers, you can Google that in two minutes. But get that dialed in. It helps a lot. By the same token, create author pages. Okay, so that means that you know, instead of having that byline with no link to the author page, even if there's only one author for now, just get that page set up. Search engines are actually looking at the qualities of authors or these personas or personalities online to help them figure out um, what content's important. Okay, because social signals are more important than ever in SEO right now. Uh, image and video sitemaps. Again, I believe Yoast just got this cornered uh, with WordPress SEO. If you go to the site and you don't see that, email him. I'm sure he's got some goodies for you. Get that dialed in, okay? This is kind of one of those low-hanging fruit things as well where you can just get your images and your video pretty easily on the first page of Google for different keywords and phrases. So if you're having trouble getting your, you know, getting your, your pages organically ranked really, really high, you can get your images and video currently for now using, uh, with the help of uh, site maps on the first page of Google. So go for it. Microdata or structured markup is your friend. Um, who knows what that is already? Okay, so for the uninitiated, you can go to like schema.org, for example. It's a site where all the search engines have agreed on basically markup standards, similar to like micro microformats from um, some of the guys we know and love. I can't think of the names right now. But basically, we can search and agree upon, search and agree upon standard, and you can basically get all of your content dialed in so that you'll have, you know, as far as trends go, you'll have a leg up on your competition because it's actually not easy to get all that stuff dialed in. What I'm talking about is you know, events, products, reviews, all these different kinds of uh, content essentially have um, uh, well-defined semantics that you can find there and add to your, uh, to your templates. She asked about the, site, the, the plugin I'm recommending for sitemaps, WordPress SEO by Yoast and Box. It's got too many goodies. Um, it shouldn't be free. Uh, switch to HTML5, okay? So in terms of goodies, like HTML5 has got it. It's, it's built for the web today. It doesn't have everything that I would like. No, it doesn't have everything you would like, probably not. But it works super good in terms of giving you what you need to do responsive web design, to do you know, very performant implementations of apps for just even publisher websites. Um, more than I can talk about right now, I'm sure there's a number of you who know all this already. But just make sure that you're using it, take advantage of it. There's just so many goodies in there. Same thing for CSS3, but HTML5 is critical for mobile. In terms of driving traffic, I alluded twice uh, to mastering next click opportunities. A lot of these things you probably know and, and, and hopefully love, but you know, related posts, uh, trending content, you know, personalization, um, calls to action for subscribing to newsletters or following topics or following other people on the site or you know friending people. All these kinds of things are next click opportunities. But the goal is is to keep people on the site, keep them engaged, keep them drilling down, 
you know, have them, you know, share out content or contribute with comments, or maybe you want to do something like bubble up authoritative uh, commenters on your site, people who spend a lot of time adding value. There's all these different kinds of ways that you can make your site engaging, and you should think about them in exactly this way. Essentially, figuring out what you can do to make people want to click more. I know that sounds uh, painfully obvious, okay? But it's not just, you know, a related post plugin is not going to do it for you. You've actually got to take the time to think about, if I was reading this site, what would make me stay, right? So editorial links are our next quick opportunity. Can't go wrong with that. Um, so take the time to figure that out. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of plugins that do uh, a magical job of bubbling up trending or related content. And your developers, you can get in there and you can you, you do some you know, Google Analytics uh, magic or you know, pull some, some data out of you know, social media or, or open graph and Facebook or something like that. Figure out how to bubble that up. Can you jump up and use the mic? It sounds like you're saying something good. I hope so. DK's good, WP Security. Um, there are some affiliate link plugins that you can use instead of sending a lost site to affiliate sites, you can send them into your own site. They snatch words out of posts and pages. So there's a few of those around. Google like affiliate link plugins. That's awesome. That's exactly what I mean. So think creatively like that. What he said is, you know, a gold mine. Okay? But and this is a bit of an aside, there's 19,000 plus plugins, it grows like quite rampantly, if that's a word. I recommend when you can, you know, contributing back to these uh, plugin developers when you find something that you want to add, hopefully they'll be nice and they'll add it, uh, or at least tell you how they you know, how they like that contribution so they can add it. And, uh, you know, let's bubble up some more plugins that do exactly what he's talking about, because it adds a lot of value. At the end of the day, you know, we've got families and friends and stuff like that. We're just trying to, you know, recommend products and services that actually help people uh, or give people, you know, useful information so they can do whatever it is that they do better. Um, so we need to, to work together to make that happen. Another thing that's interesting that I didn't mention earlier, though, in earlier in terms of next week opportunities is pagination within posts. I see this on some niche sites. So I think you can get away with it on a number of them. I, I usually read like lots of hardware reviews and stuff like that because I'm a geek. They do a phenomenal job of like breaking, um, you know, basically what's probably like I don't know, a thousand words into like ten pages, and you actually want to go and drill down into it. So figure out how to do that for yourself. Galleries are phenomenal. I think Business Insider is just, they crush it. They just know how to do it. They're like, they have you know, 300 words, and it's like, great, I want to keep reading. And they're like, click here to keep reading. And I'm like, I have to do it, you know? And then I click through, and it's like, oh, here's a gallery. And I'm like, so there's your visual, a little bit of copy, and you just, you want to keep going, right? And so they monetize their site with, uh, with ads. And so, you know, on a given post, just one guy like me, I did, you know, 12, 15, 30, you know, uh, page views, and just, you know, going through one of their galleries, right? And then as soon as I finish, they don't let me go, right? They've got, here's some more, you know, like, and I want to read them, right? Because the files are great and everything else, right? So, again, um, I think uh, Next Gen Gallery was just bought by somebody, I don't know who, but maybe that uh, plugin will also get, what's that? Okay, maybe that plugin will also get um, some more uh, functionality in terms of next quick opportunities. Uh, another thing is make everything shareable, all right? So um, I can't really explain it right now because we got five minutes, so I'm going to race through this. Being social um, means a lot of different things. I already talked about using larger images on, uh, on Pinterest. I talked about um, uh, media basically being the best thing to share on social media. I mean, images and video as opposed to links. Um, canonical headers are something that's interesting uh, from a technical standpoint in terms of, I'm sure you guys know this, Pinterest started adding attribution to, um, to their service. Uh, canonical headers do the same thing when your images are shared directly from your website. Uh, so that'll be interesting in the future for those of you that are worried about having your images basically being taken and helping somebody else. Um, networking offline helps your site online. Um, I, don't, I, I suppose you know that because you're here, but it needs to be said. Allow and give guest posts, okay? So if, you're, if you're pump, your site allows it in, in, in terms of the content that you provide, it certainly doesn't hurt, and you can get a lot of, obviously, editorial links, uh, excuse me, authoritative links 
from participating on sites that have, you know, that are larger than yours or that are tangential or, or directly related to yours. Facebook comments are, are really successful for a lot of folks. Obviously, you know, it takes the discussion into Facebook for you. Live Fire is also really popular in terms of the larger publishers. I think it might do well for some of you. And uh, Discuss continues to do well. Their analytics, I think, are really, really strong. So can't really go wrong with them. Obviously, they integrate with lots of social services. A common pitfall that I think we all need to think about if you're fortunate enough to be able to cultivate comments in your website, okay, reply to those people, engage them the same way that you're doing, it sounds like, in social media. Um, you just can't shortchange that. In terms of performance, which is probably what uh, many of you expect me to talk about uh, here, optimize your social media buttons. There's a, there's a post on our site that helps you figure out how to do that. A lot of times you have to have multiple Facebook widgets on your site if you care about Facebook at all. There's a lot of things that you could be doing wrong in terms of downloading the two megs of crap that Facebook makes you download depending on the plugin that you're using. This will, that uh, post will help you figure out what you can, uh, what you can do to optimize that. Um, it's really not optional anymore. You've got, I mean, zero is the optimal amount of time someone should wait to download your site, you know, zero seconds. But since we can't do that yet, you know, four seconds is, is about the limit. The better you do, the more next click. Uh, next clicks you're going to get from those page views, the greater your time on the site, and all those things I'm sure you know. If you've ever scrolled down a website, uh, you know, because you, know, you went to the home page, you go to the site all the time, and then you're looking for the link or whatever it is that you want, you click it right on the page, and then as you're reading through it, it jumps back up to the top of the page, that's because the onload event has fired randomly, probably because Facebook slowed your site down or something like that. Um, and yes, I'm picking on Facebook. And so the, the problem with that is, okay, you've obviously got to dial it in. So webpagetest.org helps you figure that out. Um, when it's firing, what's happening, it's obviously a usability issue. Um, and there are a lot of ways to optimize that. You can use WG Total Cash to help you out. Um, for mobile, you know, given page today is about a meg. Obviously, you want to do what you can to optimize your media. That's usually the heaviest thing. If you've got too many scripts, get rid of them or minify them. Um, but uh, make sure, especially if you've got some, some mobile activity, that you dial that in. Monetization, I'll race through super quickly. Um, if you've got a lot of content, monetize it with ebooks. There's no reason why you can't. Just curate that stuff into an ebook, monetize it if it's evergreen content. Um, you can also uh, just focus on earning your actual uh, your, your readership, right? So even if you're talking about topics that other larger publishers are talking about, don't really try to interrupt the, the, their user experience with uh, interstitials, prestitials, or any kind of ads that are uh, disruptive. Focus on making the content the thing that makes people come to your website, and then you won't have any trouble generating those page views and, and those additional ad dollars. Um, AdSense on old posts after three or four days, you know, depending on if you use any kind of unit you want, but that older content, when someone first comes to the website, show it to them a, a nice clean page, it's easy to read, but then as that content gets older, you can use AdSense, just whatever you like, you know, it's easy to have a conditional in your template to do that. Same thing for searching for four pages. Um, eat your own dog food. We talked about affiliate earlier. If you use services and you love them, recommend them, have those people pay you for recommending them. Uh, not a bad idea. In terms of conversion rates, uh, even though this is the monetization section, um, Wufu is a phenomenal tool. Lots of hosts do a terrible job of actually sending the emails out that you get through the forms on your website. You wouldn't know this, there's just no way to know unless you have your own server. So Wufu actually uses JavaScript to, uh, to display that form and they send it to you quite reliably. We saw our conversion rates go up when we switched to them. So I recommend that. Um, if you've got a native app suggested to keep your site functional, like we talked about earlier, um, progressive enhancement really isn't optional today. In terms of security, uh, I recommend securing. Uh, who uses that yet already, by the way? Anybody? All right, good. So those guys are great. Uh, use nonces. Make sure your wp-config is fully dialed in. There's lots of stuff in the codex about all that. Um, let's see what else. Um, Nightly backups, it's not optional. Basically, the way to think about it is, if you've got, um, who, who uses a Mac? Everybody? Everybody, okay, so who's got Time Capsule? Everybody? Okay, Time Capsule, every hour, backs up your stuff, right? If you can do that with your site, well, I guess you can. Get Vault Press, it'll do that for you. Treat your website like you treat your MacBook, it'll be an issue. Um, 
Basic authentication for WP admin is phenomenal. Uh, I think it was the next web actually ended up getting hacked, and it wasn't a hack like you would expect. That the uh, the hacker actually went in and put links to you know did link building, put links into their site and pointed at his site. They could have avoided that um, simply by uh, using basic authentication uh, on WP admin and WP login.php. So I'm out of time. There's only a couple more things. Uh, if you have questions, you can find me later. And Mason is still in the hallway. So I guess that's it.